with the sponsorship of the Gamma Group. Welcome to Rumbo Minero. How are you, Cesar? What a pleasure, Jorge, as always. Together with Cesar Campos, my name is Jorge Leon Benavides. We are going to develop the following program, a very important program. We have been talking about Petro Peru, but now we are going to talk with Martin Belaunde Morera, lawyer and former congressman of the Republic, and with Cesar Gutierrez, former president of Petro Peru, to have an in-depth dialogue. What is the solution for Petro Peru with what has just been proposed by Petro Peru's board of directors? What else do we have? Well, we are going to be with Diego Macera, uh, director of the Peruvian Institute of Economics, also a member of the board of directors of the Central Reserve Bank, to discuss about this increase in the monetary poverty index determined by the National Institute of Statistics and Informatics. And what would be its impact on the... Cesar, that's right. So next, join us for the main mining news of the week by Gabriela Chicoma. Thank you, Jorge. These are the main mining news of the week. The British mining company First and Silver informed that it has signed a contract to start its inaugural one 500 meters diamond drilling program in the coming weeks at its Santa's Gloria high grade silver project located 100 kilometers from Lima. This activity will be financed by a private placement. The private investment promotion agency Pro Inversion added to the next year's portfolio the opportunity to exploit phosphate rock in the Bayobar 9 concession, which would generate investment commitments of USD, 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 and would be oriented, among others, to boost non-metallic mining for the agricultural expansion of the country. Many thanks to Gabriela Chicoma for the main news of the week. We now meet Diego Macera, director of the Peruvian Institute of Economics. Peruvian Institute of Economics. We are going to talk a little bit about poverty reduction and the importance of formal mining. Diego, how are you? Hello, how are you? Thank you for the invitation. Diego, tell us a little bit about, as you know, the INE confirmed that poverty has escalated, unfortunately, which is going down very fast, going up very fast. Goes down very fast, it goes up very fast but to lower it requires years of work in our country. According to the report, monetary poverty evolved. They have used that term, which I would like you to clarify. Clarify for us. This means that now 9,780,000 people are poor in Peru. We are, we are talking about almost 10 million, which is almost the population of Lima. This includes those who are on the verge of being poor because they have also approached the abyss, another group that is not doing well economically. Tell us a little bit about what situation we are in with respect to that. Let's see, there has been a sharp reduction of revenues last year, which was actually foreseeable because no one expected, was foreseeable, because nobody expected poverty to be reduced the year before because the GDP had contracted, because GDP had contracted. We were at less than 1.5, less than 1.6 last year in economic movement. So actually the discussion among the specialists was how much poverty was going to go up. It was not a surprise that it went up. And more or less the estimates were that it was going to be a number close to 30%. Before I start with the topic of yes. the term monetary poverty, so you can explain, why did the GDP go down? Well, there were several factors. The weather was one of them, especially in the second and third quarters with bad harvests. Uh, you also had the strong protests in January, February. There was a very bad first quarter the year before. And the third important component is the lack of confidence in the Peruvian economy, which also slowed investments. Uh, I believe that these three variables, climate, protests, and confidence, explain last year's bad result. Now then, as I was saying, it was foreseeable that we were going to have an increase in poverty. The question was how much? And with respect to monetary poverty, this is to differentiate it a little bit from multidimensional poverty. That is to say, what is being evaluated here, what INE is evaluating is the capacity of Peruvian households to acquire a basic consumption basket, which includes food, housing, and clothing. A base, a minimum, is calculated and families that are below that minimum are classified as monetary poor. 
There are other ways of measuring poverty. If you want more multidimensional, there you have access to certain services. But in this one, we are exclusively focusing on what is the spending capacity of families per person. That is the way it is being evaluated. Then, and the other denomination that you have there is extreme poverty. The difference is that with total poverty, you are evaluating the entire basic consumption basket. With extreme poverty, you are evaluating only the capacity of the families to pay at least the food portion. So uh, the extreme poor are those families, those people in which you cannot access even the basic food basket. Mining, now I say that is the more or less current panorama, the conjunctural thing that has influenced this increase of poverty, the but, increase in poverty. But we have to analyze it in a historical cycle of at least 15 years of at least 15 years. I remember when Michael Porter, the great Harvard guru, came to tell us in 2009 that we were living the fiction of economic growth, that we were living in the fiction of economic growth only by measuring, measuring the part of, of the greater dynamics of the placement of commodities in the international market, etc., 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 which were very interesting economic growth indexes. But at the same time, he noted institutional factors, the institutional factors, the strengthening of education, the improvement of health, and above all, the strengthening of democratic institutions that have collapsed more evidently since the conflict between Fujimorismo and PPK. Fujimorismo with PPK, plus all the deceptions to which Mr. Vizcarra has subjected us. Vizcarra subjected us to during his term. Remember that the International Monetary Fund, a mission sent here in the year 2019, in the year 2019 said that the Vizcarra government has stopped the process of productivity and production in Peru, and production in Peru for lack of initiatives, especially in public spending. So how much of this injection of a historical cycle, how much of this injection of a really painful historical cycle the last 15 years has to do also with the lack of public spending, especially in the public sector? I would say even more than 15 years. This has to be seen in the context of the last 20 years, which is when we have data, 20 years, which is when we have data. In other words, Peru has been an international success story in terms of poverty reduction. If you want more or less until the year 2015, 2016, it is no longer possible to advance so fast. And we are close to 20 for a poverty rate of 20%. 20%. Up to the year 2015, more or less, we had managed to reduce poverty from 58, 59%. That was almost double what we have today as of 2004. This is very important because, of course, sometimes, and rightly so, sometimes we say that last year was a very bad year. An increase in poverty, I totally agree. This has to be improved. We must also see where we come from. You have to see the whole movie. Uh, the complete film is 2004. Uh, we had almost 60% poverty. We reduced it fast with economic growth. That is the way to reduce poverty. There is no other way. There is no other way. Economic growth is what reduces poverty. The more you grow, the more you reduce poverty. Uh, we achieved that while we were growing fast until 2015. Then we started to slow down. From there, we were close to a poverty rate of 20%. 21 until 2019. Let's say at our minimum. Then comes the pandemic. 2020, we went up to 30. 10 points of increase in poverty. Uh, and from there, we stayed in the interim at 25, 27, 29. Now the poverty rate, which we have not been able to overcome. Why? Because we are not growing. I believe it is definitely a management issue for the government to change this issue and to be able to recover what happened in the pandemic. Now, what has to happen? Because for me, I think for many, investment grade is one of the great attractions of Peru, as well as its mineral resources. The investment grade, if we lose it, we are going to be in serious trouble. We are going to be in a serious predicament because talking to some international investors, they tell me we invest new projects only in countries Great in countries country. that have investment grade. So we have to take care of it. Now we are on the lowest line at the bottom. Line at the bottom. Now what would have to happen for us to lose our investment grade rating? That the path we are on is a path of losing investment grade. Investment grade. The path, the path of less and less perception of fiscal responsibility. Fiscal responsibility a deteriorating perception of the political future. This will probably lead a rating agency in the next few months to suddenly downgrade one more notch. Now, be careful. There is for the people, the public to understand. They are three raters. They are not three. They matter. 
there are more important ones. Standard, Ampours, Moody's, and Fitch. Is it they difficult? The, the, that downgraded us for the year. Uh, the one a little while ago was standard. Ampours put us one, one grade away from losing the grade. There are different grades. This one has put us at the last level corresponding to investment grade, investment grade. At Moody's, we are at two. There is still a space, and in Fitch, we are at one. So there you still have that additional space. But the deterioration trajectory is worrisome. If we lose that investment grade that cost us 15 years, it could be further back. 15 years, it could be further back. Uh, we were just presenting the book on how the Peruvian debt was restructured uh, in the 90s. It could be 30 years ago as well, 35. What it has cost us to build that investment grade. And once we get it back, what you lose much faster than you get it back. Recovery. You have to do you have a lot to of make squeezing. A lot of, merit, of course, the reduction. I mean, so you can get reduced. You have to make a lot of effort to get down several steps very quickly, but it takes you several years to gain them back. And what you say is absolutely true. This dries up your investment, investment markets, because a lot of outside investors are watching. Hey, I support you. I put my money here. I bet you as long as you are investment grade. So as not to disassociate it from mining, just this week, the information came out that Peru has fallen to 25 positions in the world mining ranking. In the world mining ranking, according to the Fraser Institute, and it has to do with investment attractiveness. And there we have lost an enormous amount. We had really competitive positions in Fraser, and we have been leaving the truth, not doing much. Uh, in today's world, not doing much is the same as going backwards, because the rest of the countries are doing it. Sometimes we think we live on an island. The rest of the countries are trying to move forward, are trying to improve their policies. Uh, some more than others. But we actually, in terms of policy, in terms of perception of mining policy, we have been moving backwards uh, to the last ones. You can see it in... Diego, briefly, we're out of time. Three points that you would say that the government needs to work on now so that we don't lose this degree of... Startup. We have to get mining projects out faster. Later on, we have some very good ones. I think we have to make some kind of improvements in the reform, some kind of tax reform to simplify the controversy processes, to make it faster, more expeditious. That is urgent. And third, we need a clearer vision of fiscal responsibility, one that we do not have today. Investment. Thank you very much, Diego, for being with us. As always, very interesting the way you approach these issues in order to understand them in a much more didactic way. Much more didactic. We will talk about you with us another time. Gabriela Chicoma has an ad for Expomina. Go ahead, Gabriela. Thank you very much. Expomina Peru, the largest and most important mining event in the world with 16 years of trajectory, with the special participation of the United States as the guest mining country. Expomina Peru is the only Peruvian event certified by the United States Department of Commerce. Do not be left out and be part of this great mining event. Reserve your booth at Expomina Peru. For more information, visit our website www.expominaperu.com Well, we now meet with Dr. Martin Belonde Moreira, lawyer and former congressman of the Republic, and with Cesar Gutierrez, former president of Petro Peru. Throughout these months, we have been discussing the subject of Petro Peru. Definitely. Recently, there has been news from Petro Peru's board of directors about an idea that a private company could manage Petro Peru. They have given an idea in the board of directors, and we want to see what implications this would have. The government spokesperson has come out to say that it is not going to, not going to be carried out. They are, as always, this government, unfortunately, going back and forth. But for that reason, we have invited two specialists, each one in his field, so that they can explain to us if this idea of the board of directors can really be implemented, it cannot be forgotten. It cannot be forgotten. So welcome to, welcome both, to them. both of Thank them. you very much for being in Rumbo Minero. Thank you for inviting me. No, my pleasure. Martin, the board of Petro Peru has indicated in a recent communique that it communicated to its general shareholders meeting the urgency of privatizing the company and that there is no other way out. The company and that there is no other way out. To refloat it as it urgently requires a $200 million, $200 million. We are tired of hearing figures that all Peruvians have to take out of our wallets. What do you think about this idea? Look, Gore, it seems to me, according to the latest interview that appeared in El Comercio of Oliver Stork, 
He has clarified what he is looking for is not privatization. This is a consultation with the general shareholders meeting with a view to a private private company to take over management. It is not clear to us whether this also implies the board of directors. We know that Petro Peru is a sole shareholder company owned by the state. And that means that a measure of this type that is not authorized in the legislative decree 1031, in my opinion, could not be carried out if Congress does not pass a special law to that effect. The spokesman for the President of the Republic has just said that Petro Peru will not be privatized. Petro Peru. But it is evident from the sense of the consultation to the general shareholders meeting, which is the highest order, the highest body within the company, and which represents the government. That would imply, in my opinion, a legal, legal change. Now, but let's graph a little bit, Cesar, what has been said from the beginning. I have had the occasion to follow you in everything that you have written and stated after this announcement. Anthony Lau, who is also an expert that we have had many times here, and uh, the conclusion is that the initial message was very confusing. It is true what Martin Belonde says in the sense that that Oliver Starr has tried, as the president says, to clarify. Now your proposal is much more audacious because you say, if it is indeed possible that this could be studied, but through a bankruptcy proceeding that would have to be to be submitted to an indecopio. I would like you to elaborate on that. Look, the issue, whether it is management or if I hire a company to manage the administration of the company, keeping the board of directors, or if I decide to privatize, I would like to know if you could or go deeper into to that. privatize requires some time because there is a competition process to make it transparent. The question is, how long is the time? Approximately 18 or 24 months is the time to either hand it over to management or in any case to privatize. The question is, what do I do in the 18 or 24 months? Because I have overdue debts. Those overdue debts are $2 billion. And I have $340 million to pay between June and December. So how? How to solve that? And then what I was saying is somebody has to put up the money. The Treasury should not contribute, although I have the impression that Arista has the vocation to do so. There is an interview out there in the newspaper gestion that leaves open that possibility. possibility. So the only way to avoid costing the Treasury is to reach an agreement with the creditors and tell them, hey, I can't pay. I can't pay. We are going to restructure the payments. And we need you to believe me and let's go in decopy. Indecopy will determine whether the payment plan presented by Petro is credible and on the way we could enter into a restructuring idea, private management in any case, you think. But Indecopy would admit private management. Yes. But no. Would but it really save it? Would could this save just what I'm saying? Since you would have to put money in, the state shouldn't put money in. It puts you together with the creditors. We are seeing along the way the management in the hands of the creditors. He, the road will see if it is viable or not. And it could be a restructuring, a liquidation in progress, if it means. This is a figure. Is it a figure similar to that of the soccer clubs? Of course it is. Universitario, That's isn't right. it? That's right. Or the case Doderanga. That is an issue. Either we can enter into a corporate restructuring or we go through an ongoing liquidation, which means sale of assets. That I think is the healthiest thing to do. Because my impression is that the government is going to want to issue sovereign debt and then partially meet it and have 24 months to think about it when it's gone. Okay, it would be interesting to hear Dr. Belagon about. Well, my dear Cesar, mentioned a case that really didn't work out. Doran has gone into liquidation. After the year 2009, it has not operated again. So, in my opinion, operationally, the track record is very bad. The precedent is very bad for Petro Peru. But I ask myself the following question, and this is one that the government should ask itself. Can we do without Petro Peru for the normal supply of fuel throughout Peru? Of Peru, we can, for example, Petro Peru has the Talara refinery, the Conchan refinery, I believe it has a refinery in Pucallpa and a refinery in Iquitos. And a refinery in Iquitos 
in my opinion, may Cesar Gutierrez correct me, who supplies fuels the Amazon region to Loreto to Bucalpa. But the truth is that it has lost market since it went from 50% to 25%. I am sorry. Excuse me, excuse me. Has it lost market in that area? I have my doubts because it is the only one with refineries in that area. Then I doubt it very much, Cesar corrects me. The operational expert on the matter, I am not, I am just a lawyer, a mere lawyer. If we can do without Petro Peru in the Amazon, can Iquitos run out of oil? Can Iquitos Pucalpa go without oil? Cesar. And before that, the case of Dore Ranga, the two Cobrisa production units, the Daria group in operation, the metallurgical complex in La Roya, a company has been formed with the workers and they are already operating. It has been a tortuous path. That's the way it is on the subject. 25% of the market in Tal in Iquitos has been reduced. The Talara refinery is not operating due to lack of crude oil. What are they doing? Through third parties, they are taking it to the service stations identified with Petro de la Costa via Pucalpa in a via Pucalpa in a river flow. So it is possible if it is possible. That is, it is That's possible your... because look at the assets Petro de Costa has. Peru, Iquitos already produces without the specification required by the market. It cannot continue operating. And the case of Conchan is the same. What did you keep with Talara and the San Isidro building, those assets? Then, yes, you can. Someone would say, hey, but it is sold at preferential prices in the Amazon. I prefer to subsidize that preferential price, which can be sold by four or four or any of the four actors in the market. And if he supplies service stations of certain conditions, he invents keeping one thing. If you, if had, you the had the decision at this moment, what would you do with Petro Peru? What would you do with Petro Peru? Look, first, I would agree with the government, so you should not authorize me, but I would take it into copy. I say that, of course, because I can't put money in. I have to manage with the creditors while the company is going on. Creative companies if, are also going I bankrupt. That this is not viable. Let's go to an ongoing liquidation. Martin, what would you do? What would you do with Petro Peru? Well, I, there is one thing I would try to do. Not to interrupt the commercialization and supply of fuels in Peru. In Peru. He just told me that the Iquitos refinery is not working. Anyway. He is an operational man. I am a man of, of law, but realistic. Insolvency, that's fine. And what if the creditors say, I don't want to put money in? I would rather, which is what a creditor would logically do. A creditor would do. I want to be paid. Therefore, that they auction off the assets of Petro Peru. And what are Petro Peru's assets? Excuse me for being a bit vehement, but this is a national issue that concerns each and every Peruvian. In my opinion, Petro Peru has the refinery that has already been mentioned. The pipeline, the pipeline from what is the lot, 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 well, to finish, Cesar, a Talara refinery that has a very important unit that had been presented with great fanfare that is not operational, that is not working, that is not operating, that is not operational, that is not working in its entirety. It, in my piece, it is, it's totality. And on top of that, it is that arresting. 70 to 70% of the crude that it processes comes from Ecuador and 30 with a declining trend. In other words, it is really the only asset of almost any value. Plus the building, which with other buildings plus, is worth $140 million in an $8.5 billion site. Now, the thesis that the creditor would have to put. Hey, is that look, if I tell him I can't pay, he will bring you insolvency. There are two possibilities of insolvency. Either you go voluntarily or the creditors do not agree. Well, that's that. That's it. Who beats us? Guarantees that the creditor will put up money? Or oh, he is not going to put money in. He is not that saying is so. Going to yes, I will be saying that he does not have it. So I say the following. Then. First of all. 
This consultation, everything is fine. The procedural form is fine. But this decision does not only correspond to the executive branch, there has to be a special law because the legislative decree of LXXLXLXLXL does not authorize such an operation. And this is a very important the legal problem. The problem is not in, in seeing that it is the real problem. The strongest problem is the state's wallet that has to be disbursing because if Petro Peru did not ask for money, we would not be able to talk about anything else. You did not want to add something to finish. Yes, yes, look. There is a law from the year 2013, 3130, that allows you to sell up to 49% of the assets and prevents the state from increasing capital, so that in one year, the private hospital increases and loses control. That is possible, there is a mix there. Of course, then what is it that happens? The pipeline has become a sieve. In other words, the number of failures per year is very high. Zero reliability. I think it is very small. With the money we have paid in all these years, we could have imported a lot of oil. A figure that has been contributing since year two, that has been contributing since the year 2017 with a capital increase that passed silently. The sum, capital increases, loans, and guarantees it has been given $4 billion. 17 to date in place. And what Thank, else? You Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, little one. Chiquitito. The 49% formula can be used. It is in the legislative decree of LX, 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 LX. But that means partial privatization, partial privatization. As far as I am concerned, let it be done because Petro Peru cannot be like that. The only thing I say, there will be interested parties to assume the 49% of capitalism. It is a question mark unknown, unknown, and also a topic of discussion still. Activos. But we have to solve it because unfortunately this issue of the government's giant wallet that affects all Peruvians cannot continue less in a country. The kitchen has to be not a penny more of the end. Not a penny more. Thank you both very much. It was Dr. Martin Belagunde Moreira, lawyer and former congressman of the Republic, and Mr. Cesar. Gutierrez, former president of Petro Peru. Thank you very much for being with us. Now we are going to listen to Gabriela about Expomina. The big fair is you are a supplier or you want to be a supplier. Go ahead, Gabriela. Thank you very much. Expo Mina Peru, the largest and most important mining event in Peru in 2024 with 16 years of trajectory. Do business with the mining sector of Peru and America. Expo Mina Peru from September 11th to 13th, 2024 at the Yoken Lima Exhibition Center. Portfolio of mining projects in Peru for more than $53 million and portfolio of mining projects in America for $450 million. Invest with the leaders. Participate in Expo Mina Peru 2024. For more information, check our website www.expominaperu.com. Maldarumi, a company dedicated to the acquisition and processing of gold ore, committed to sustainable development and social responsibility. We guarantee full traceability of our products. We use state-of-the-art industrial technologies that allow us to guarantee efficiency in the production process, maximize our resources and protect the environment, fulfilling our commitment to preserve nature. Paltarumisak. Together we are better. Minero Samsak is a Peruvian public company with a great purpose, to give life back to the planet. Thus, we are dedicated to contribute to the sustainable development of the country through Mining Environmental Remediation In MSAC, we recover the areas affected by high and very high risk mining liabilities that are in a situation of abandonment or in which the state has not identified those responsible. In this line of work, we are currently present in 11 regions of Peru with a portfolio of 65 remediation projects in different phases. Promotion of private investment. In AMSEC we represent the Peruvian state as counterpart of the transfer contracts of important mining projects 
and we also supervise the fulfillment of the commitments and obligations that are part of these processes. Today we are leaders in business management systems. Among the 35 companies in the Fonafe Corporation, we have ISO 9001 certifications in environmental management, environmental management, and environmental management. In environmental management. ISO 37001 in anti-bribery management, and ISO 45001 in environmental and management. And ISO 45001 in occupational health and safety management. At AMSAC, sustainability and care for the planet are our DNA, and for this reason we are proud to contribute to creating a better world through the recovery of air, water, soil and ecosystems impacted by mining liabilities, thus contributing to the 10 out of 10 countries in which we operate. And thus contribute to 10 of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals by the year 2030. Giving life back to the planet is more than a simple phrase for us. It is the guide of our daily actions, with which we have a positive impact on the lives of thousands of Peruvians and through them on our country. We have reached the end of Petro Peru. In short, change, legal change. They say on the one hand, we could, with all the money that has been invested, this four billion, talk about importing fuel, take it to Indicopi, to a contest. And on the side of Diego Macera, the notes that I have, you will comment. There is the investment climate. We have to take care of the protests. We have to take care of the confidence. Confidence. There are several, several issues to deal with, but decisions have to be made. Of course, right? And he has clarified that there is no need to be in the absurd and false dichotomy of privatization in quotation marks of Petro Peru. It has been clearly stated, and the experts themselves say so, at least the vast majority. It is not about the procedure, but about the management. And regarding Diego Matera's comments, the most important thing is what we said at the beginning of the program, Jorge. This 25-point drop that we have in the survey in the Fraser study in Canada. This is also a wake-up call to our friend Romulo Mucho, head of the Ministry of Energy and Mines, to get their act together, as Diego Macera rightly said, in unblocking several important projects. That's right. Thank you very much for being with us. Be careful with the degrees of investment. There are three companies that are dedicated to this, but we are already close to losing investment grades. This is something that we, uh, the big investors, have to be very careful about. They do not invest in countries that do not have investment grade, we need decisions and strong decisions now. Well, Cesar Campos and Jorge Leon Benavides have been with us. Thank you very much for being with us on Rumo Minero. Next up is Peru Construye. And we thank you, of course, for tuning in.